Thank you everyone for coming uh, today to this uh, conversation with industry. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank the Arts Council uh, for putting these events together, this, uh, this very informative events together. Uh, and, uh, we'll be trying to do it uh, you know, once monthly, uh, but uh, so, and I know they take tons of work. So on those lines, I would like to thank Sarah, uh, Sarah and Gretchen. Those, without those guys, you know, none of this would happen. You know, they do so much amazing work uh, I am so grateful to uh, be part of, of this part of what the Art Council does. Uh, so thank you for all the programming, for everything. Thank you for the sponsors. Uh, and uh, today we have a very special day. Uh, we're going to be talking to three amazing panelists, as usual. You know what I mean? Uh, very distinguished panelists. I mean, their bios, I mean, I encourage you guys to look them up. I, of course, I went online and... <laughs> <laughs> the brand is like giving more and more, of course. Uh, you know, uh, I look at what they've been up to. I mean, it's just like incredible. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to start with uh, with Laura Candle uh, from Hudson TV. And uh, Laura, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and uh, what's going on at Hudson? Just tell us a little bit about Hudson and, and what, what is that all about? Sure. As the lawnmower goes by, I apologize for that. So I'm Laura Candle. I'm one of the co-founders from Hudson. And we are a localized digital storytelling platform. And we are in the process of creating an app that will uh, be available on television, on your phone, on a website. And it will have user generated local content created by Hudson Valley artists for Hudson Valley members. Um, and, you know, I think, and their neighbors, in my opinion, because um, we have such amazing regional. Uh, affiliations. And um, we have a great team creating content uh, about, you know, lifting up voices that aren't really lifted up enough around here, as well as creating really interesting and fun content. Um, so that's a little bit about Hutsi. Beautiful. Uh, then we have Kate Walsh. Kate Walsh is the editor of chief of Hudson Valley and uh, Valley Table Magazine. So uh, welcome, Kate. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and about the, the work that you're doing now. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. So yeah, I've been with um, Hudson Valley Magazine for five years now. Um, I was with Westchester Magazine before that. And Hudson Valley Magazine is celebrating its 50th anniversary next year. So we wow. have, been, yeah, it's been the, the first publication of um, Today Media before they were even Today Media. It was Martinelli Company. Um, so yeah, we've been bringing people of the Hudson Valley, you know, everything there is that's going on here. And it's really changed a lot in 50 years, yeah. um, you know, from music, art, um, food, drink, especially food and drink lately. Um, and then, yeah, so we also acquired the Valley Table two years ago. So now we're even doing more food storytelling um, and then concentrating more on, you know, the farm farmers and, you know, who's bringing that food to the table and then, the table and restaurant week and, and all of that. So. Oh, amazing. Thank you, Kate. And last but not least, we have Brian Mahoney. Uh, he's the editorial director of Chronogram Media and oversees all the operations of Chronogram, Upstate House, the River Newsroom, Upstater, Rural Intelligence, and Explore the Hudson Valley. Welcome, Brian. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you've been up to lately. Thanks, uh, Martin. And uh, Kate, you and I have never met, but I am a fan of Hudson Valley Magazine. And, uh, oh, me too. Have, have been. Um, and, you know, it's funny, one of our former art directors was Carla Rosman, whose father started Hudson Valley Magazine. Um, so I know. Wow. Ryan, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, congratulations on Valley Table. You know, we were talking with Janet um, about possibly, um, you know, taking that on and that didn't work out. And uh, I envy um, I envy you for that because that I'm sure that's a great gig to have. It um, is. It's really nice to be able to be like, yeah, that's for Valley Table. Yeah. And like, what's the difference? It's like, that's more earthy. That's Valley Table. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the, the brand differentiation can be tricky sometimes. Yeah. Um, so Chronogram um, started in 1993. I joined uh, just out of school in 96 uh, as a delivery boy. Mm. And uh, I started. I started at the bottom. I drove magazines oh, around. That's amazing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I've clawed my way up the very short corporate ladder here, <laughs> all the way to uh, editorial director. And I've been um, directing um, all the editorial operations here for the past, uh, I guess, twenty some odd years. We'll be celebrating our 
30th uh, anniversary, not in the not so distant future. Um, and yeah, I, you know, the Hudson Valley is one of the more creative spots on the planet. And it's just, you know, it's, uh, you never run out of things to cover, that's for sure. Absolutely. I mean, the Hudson Valley is such an amazing place. We're so blessed to live in the Hudson Valley. I mean, people travel to come here and see all the wonderful things that it has to offer. So, you know, I was going to ask you the next question. You kind of almost answer it, Brian, but like um, I said, you started right at the bottom, you know, the little magazines. But is this something that you always wanted to do? How did you get involved in the field itself? Yeah, uh, no, I had no idea what I wanted to do. You know, I was just, uh, I was on my eighth year of uh, college and, uh, you know, ha I had a great time in college. I went, go New Paltz. Um, and uh, kind of, I ran into somebody who I vaguely knew and said, uh, oh, you're, you're, you're studying writing. Why don't you, um, you know, write an article or two? And so I did some freelancing, you know, for uh, the local newspaper and I eventually wrote some pieces for the Village Voice and the New York Press and was, you know, writing music reviews and that kind of a thing on a freelance basis. And then I was distributing the magazines. And then the magazine was so small that the couple who started it, uh, you know, they basically did everything. So Jason was the publisher and also the editor and also the salesperson. And Amara was doing the accounts and uh, you know, doing all the clerical work and doing the layout. And so as the magazine started to grow, Jason said to me, oh, well, you write some things. Why don't you be the editor? And I was like, all right. And so, I mean, that's, that's really what happened. I have, a, I have a very unusual path. And like when I talk to students and they ask me like, you know, what's the path? And I'm like, my path is very unusual. You know, I've been at this one publication for 20 some odd years now, and I just have made my job up as I went along, basically. Right. That's great. That was amazing. So, uh, Kate, along those lines, how did you get started in this field? Um, uh, similar to uh, Brian, uh, my, I started off as a paper girl uh, back in Detroit. I delivered the Detroit Free Press for middle school through high school, read the headlines as I delivered the paper, and then decided I never wanted to go into journalism. Uh, <laughs> Whoops. So, uh, yeah, uh, and then in college, I had a um, professor, he was the head of the journalism, head of the paper, and he's like, I really think you should write for the paper, and I said, I don't want to do hard news. I had enough of like that trauma growing up reading those headlines, <laughs> and he's like, just do a few, you know, do features writing, so then I just kind of got into that niche, you know, doing feature writing, and I got a job right out of college for uh, a soap opera magazine. I was a huge soap opera fan and um, did an internship with all my children and just moved to New York wow. and started and created Soap Opera Weekly for Murdoch Magazine. So I was like one of the founding editors there when I was 22. Um, and then did more celebrity journalism. I was doing In Touch and all those crazy yeah. Kardashian covers and oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tana Mom. Uh, and then, yeah, then was living in Westchester and just wanted to write about something that I cared about and not, you know, teen moms and yeah, yeah, yeah. all that crazy stuff. Um, so it was a pleasure to move over to, you know, writing about the community where I live and highlighting people because of their accomplishments, not because they were friends with Paris Hilton. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then talking about people who were, you know, who were real, like, it was just such a crazy world that celebrity stuff, just looking at pictures of women who just had babies and, and just, and people criticizing them. Look at the baby fat, look at, you know, and now it's so wonderful that we can just talk about uh, people who look normal, but who aren't, they're just amazing, creative, people, just following their passion, whether it's, you know, hop farming or, you know, making sculptures out of soap, I don't know. Yeah. It's way more rewarding. You know, it's funny you said that you were like reading the headlines because when uh, I used to play music and I know it's an exercise that, well, I don't know if it, it is an exercise, but I heard it was an exercise to write music. Sometimes if you're stuck, they say, just read the headlines for inspiration. Because <laughs> the, the headlines, and I don't know, I'm not an editor, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but they're like very well crafted, right? Because it's basically you know, what you're going to read at a glance, so to speak, right? Oh, so yeah. it's like, uh, they're very clever the way the headlines are written. So, uh, but anyway, so that reminds me of that. Uh, anyways, uh, thank you, Kate. And Laura, along those lines, you're a little bit different because you're in, uh, in uh, media, right? 
So, but I know you have some experience with the uh, with um, uh, Woodstock Film Festival for quite a few years, for over twelve years. How yeah. did you get involved into into video or like uh, digital media like this? I mean, by accident, <laughs> I think. I mean, I think it's interesting. The three of us have a very similar path to this. I, when I was a teenager, I loved film, and I and the Woodstock Film Festival was right around the corner. So I said, I'm just going to go volunteer. Um, twelve years later, in the VIP guest relations department, I spent a lot of time with you know lots of different media figures and sort of getting the what it was like to be in that arena um, and during that time I also had started my career in the contemporary craft world and I was producing indoor and outdoor crafts festivals oh. um, and uh, and really getting to see sort of the how to work alongside media where I, I believe Kate you have actually covered me many a time yep. over the years <laughs> um, and uh, and just learning how to pitch stories and be interviewed and and um, and you know now I, I've been fortunate I, I happen to have left my 17 uh, year career in in the contemporary craft show world two weeks before the pandemic started and I had no idea it was coming um, and I was so fortunate to connect with the the team at Hutsey and and really it was just sort of a natural moment of saying okay what can I offer to you that you really need and they really needed an operations person so I I was very fortunate to have had an arts background that really worked alongside the the type of work that they do but they really needed somebody to help them push it forward so um, I'm I'm so fortunate to be working with them and I never thought that I'd be in video production but I've always had so many opinions on the things that I'm watching. So now I get to put them into action. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's actually quite thrilling for me to be producing a couple of shows and really seeing how the process is from start to finish. That's um, amazing. And we're, we really are trying to figure out how the, the combination of print and video can really be uh, you know, a team. Uh, so that's, I'm interested to see how that works here too. Thank you. Yeah, that's amazing. Sometimes the best thing to do is just kind of show up, right? So you have the opportunity to show up and see what doors open, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we are uh, COVID-19, the COVID with the pandemic. So, I mean, of course, it's going to be a COVID-related question because people are interested, right? Mm -hmm. So, because uh, we're still very much in it, even though things are opening up and we're getting vaccines, you know, and got, I've been vaccinated, whatever, but we still have to be careful. So the question is like towards like uh, coverage for like uh, e events, right? So uh, uh, clearly COVID-19 affected the uh, uh, reporting, right? How you guys uh, go about reporting and covering events. Uh, what has changed over the past year? Do virtual events get the same coverage as events in person? Or how do you guys go about it? How, what, in digital media, like if we, if we go with you, uh, uh, Laura, how do you guys do it? What has changed for you guys? So um, again, we only started full time in February of this year, but we were working prior to that, um, just sort of bootstrapping things, trying to make everything work. And our team, um, the other two of the, or actually the other three co-founders, uh, Angel, Jesse, and Sean, they were out and about really paying attention to what was going on with all the social justice movements and everything that was happening and really sort of prioritizing where the importance was and where they could be the safest in doing it. So we had to make sure that all of the COVID protocols were really, um, you know, safety was number one, but we felt very strongly that we needed to make sure that all the history that was in front of us was actually being covered. Uh, so our team took that to heart um, a lot of those pieces ended up as social media pieces, um, but they've also sort of informed some, some other, you know, pieces that we're working on, hopefully in a larger scale as we uh, create the content for our, our upcoming app. Thank you. And Kate, how's it uh, been for you uh, during COVID times? How has this uh, been affecting the reporting? Uh, well, it was interesting because, the, yeah, when everything shut down, it was about 10 days before before we were closing our May issue. I mean, we were just like, yeah, like a week away. So we had to scrap 90% of the book and just, you just recreate it. And luckily I had the weekly magazine background. So we, we just cobbled it together and, um, you know, reported on the pandemic. But the next issue was supposed to be summer fun, which is like <laughs> summer events. <laughs> 
<laughs> festivals. And so that was a real scramble. We, you know, we just concentrated on all outdoor activities. I, I had read this book about waterfalls from this guy and he was actually going to give us a small sidebar and I turned that into a feature, <laughs> you right. know, like where to go to see waterfalls and and then, you know, we get the pushback from that too. It's like, why are you sending people to these places? Now everybody's there. And so uh, that was a dilemma too. Like what parks and trails can we write about? Cause then people are gonna get mad about that. So we had to do a lot of updating on the website. This trail is closed. Don't go here, don't park here. Um, but by fall, luckily we were able to put together our fall events guide because we you know, realized, I mean, we were working on that issue in July. Mm. August. No, it had to close August 1st. So um, we started off with virtual events, having it all together. And then as we got closer and closer to the deadline, we hear this is actually happening or we're moving this outdoors. So we were able to, to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a responsibility because I mean, uh, wh wh if I travel somewhere, like the first thing I open, I open the local magazine or some magazine in the area of what to do here. Right. And then if everything's shutting down, right, it must have been crazy yeah yeah really crazy and then the, yeah you don't want to disappoint people get people mad you know we get these letters from people on my hiking club they're like you gave away our secret how could you do that yeah <laughs> i hear it and brian for you as well because uh you guys have all the different brands like uh you know explore hudson valley uh you know the upstate or all that stuff how did you guys do with COVID when everything was up in the air? What was that uh, for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, we went all COVID all the time, like everybody did, right? Everything was seen through this particular lens of COVID. Like Kate, you know, Chronogram was about to go to print. And so we threw that away and said, okay, what now? And so all the stories started to take on, uh, here is how this industry is dealing with COVID. So we would talk to artists, we would talk to, you know, various entrepreneurs, we would talk to you know, school teachers, you, know, you name it, right? And so that was coverage that we did for uh, probably a solid, you know, three or four months of just going around. And then, you know, the River Newsroom, we, we went all COVID all the time. You know, our, our managing editor and our staff writer were sending out, you know, long newsletters six days a week, updating people on the numbers, like just as, as the pandemics really started to kick off. And we've just pivoted in the past couple of weeks away from you know, almost daily COVID. And so now, you know, that we're pivoting there towards this little thing that you may have heard about called climate change, right? Something where like, we didn't even talk about that because we were so, we were so busy talking about the pandemic, right? And so, you know, it's exciting now to kind of be able to focus on some things that are not pandemic related. Right now we're working in Chronogram on our blockbuster summer arts preview. And there's a lot of stuff about to happen. Yeah. You know, I'm um, gonna ask you next. Yeah, I mean, so there's, but you know, you mentioned virtual events in uh, your yeah. original question, and you know, um, there weren't as many virtual events as there would normally be live events, but there were some really great ones. You know, one thing that we covered was Richard Nelson's uh, Zoom play series, The Apple Family, and so that was, you know, he was writing plays for Zoom for professional actors about this family, the Apples, who live in Rhinebeck, and the play would unwind much like this. There were people in lockdown talking to each other, but it was you know, written by an accomplished playwright. And I thought that the series, which was written specifically for Zoom during the pandemic was great. Right. You know, so there were some real examples of amazing you know, culture that was being created during the pandemic for that pandemic setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I spent a lot of time, sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, I, no. Spent a lot, I, I helped uh, uh, a lot of artists with the pivot of how to sell online and, and hosted a, I've been working with a company called Art Party Central to sort of help them develop their concept. And um, in terms of the coverage that they received from it, if they weren't using their own email lists, it would not have worked kind of thing. Like it was, it was very interesting, the challenges that they were finding and getting coverage about it. But it's been very successful and the artists have figured out how to sell direct to consumer to their customer uh, in a way that they weren't doing before. So. Uh, they actually created something that they're going to continue with even when shows come back and they're able to be out there and selling. So there have been some positive things as well as challenges that have come out of it for sure. Absolutely. You know, sometimes like, you know, uh, constraints are like the, the, the biggest inspiration for creativity. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
sometimes when you have less, you can get more creative because you don't have, you have to get, think outside the box and if you have a bunch of stuff. So yeah, a lot of artists did make the pivot and had like very successful things. But of course there was many others that struggled with it as well, you know? Uh, so well, I know like uh, uh, Wednesday, we were, we were just kind of chatting a little bit and like uh, uh, one of you guys, I think it might've been you, Brian, that brought up like uh, large scale events because people are like, aching to go and do something, right? To go mm -hmm. see this and go see that. What is going on right now as you as you guys see it with large scale events? Uh, and I get, anyone, one of you guys can take it. Or, or yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in just quickly. The, you know, the first, um, well, I mean, actually, uh, Laura, you were talking about um, something, a big, uh, you, why don't you uh, go? <laughs> sure. Uh, one of the events that I used to produce in Westchester, uh, they had their event last weekend and um, I wasn't there, but I, uh, I got my feedback and, <laughs> um, you know, they had a lot of COVID restrictions, but they were very, very clear with their customers in advance, what the requirements were, um, that you had to buy tickets in advance and how they were going to keep those customers and the artists safe. And I think that that was a huge impact on people actually choosing to say, yeah, I feel safe enough to go to this. And they sold out completely and people bought like crazy. And um, I do think that there's going to be a resurgence of these uh, outdoor, at, at least outdoor, hopefully indoor sooner than later events coming back, um, you know, with safety in mind. And, and in a way, I'm hoping that it helps to revitalize those events as well, because it's been an interesting market over the past decade where things have sort of been People have going, been going more online and less in person. And I think people are now sort of itching to be back out in the world um, and, and having human interaction. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged by everything that I've seen so far. Right, you said there were thousands of people at that event, right? Yeah, there were thousands of people at that event um, over three days, like probably 5,000 people or a three-day event, which is a significant dip from what they, you know, normally have. But even with that, they sold out instantly. <laughs> and, uh, and it was really impressive. Yeah. You know, the other thing is, like, when it comes to food and entertainment, you know, like that, maybe, Kate, maybe you can speak of this as well, uh, is, uh, you know, like, uh, for example, we wanted to go out for, to dinner for Easter, and we were, like, looking. And, like, really what we were looking, it was, like, outdoor seating. Right? What restaurants have outdoor seating versus not? Do you guys, is that something that you guys has, uh, put an emphasis on when you're covering uh, restaurants or stories or something like that? Oh, definitely. I mean, even in the winter, you know, we were doing stories on who has the heaters outside and, and uh, you we know, did. people still wanted to eat out, but we're afraid and also cold. And, um, but, and then we're, you know, we're doing restaurant week, Hudson Valley Restaurant Week, and that starts Monday, but that's usually in March. So, okay. And we said, you know, this is ridiculous. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be in March. Let's move it to May. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so the other thing is like uh, that some uh, people were curious about, and I'm curious about it as well. Uh, we are we're living through an age where it's like uh, at times where like uh, with social media and like uh, you know video consumption and things like this, it's like incredible. I mean. You can go down the rabbit hole on TikTok, man, all of a sudden, like three hours went by. It's like, what happened? <laughs> it's like, I did not mean to do that, but three hours went by and now I can't do what I was supposed to do. So, uh, no, <laughs> so, uh, so the question is uh, camera versus copy. That's the way we have, we had talked about it. How does writing uh, or publishing arts news uh, compare to video? Uh, and like, uh, and what are the advantages and disadvantages? Uh, should we print media also have a video component? Like, what do you guys think about that? And maybe we go, Kay, Brian, Laura. Yeah. What do you think about that, uh, Kay? Yeah, I actually spoke to our digital editor about this because she's the one who's publishing the, the videos. And, and she's saying that, yes, interactive media is just, you know, big online. And it's, it's what is drawing people. They're feeling more engaged. It's just, and it's a way to attract people like to, to the, the story too, that we might not have an audience that we might not have gotten before, like through Instagram stories or just all sorts of different platforms. Um, so, I mean, you know, I'm traditionalist, I'm the print person. So, sure. 
you know, I'm doing the story, but like we just did this amazing story on um, individuals of the greatest generation. So we sp spoke to seven people between the ages of 88 and 102. And um, one of the senior, uh, where one of the seniors live, they said she was actually part of this George Ezra video that went viral and it was on the like Jimmy Kimmel show or something. And uh, it was so cute. It was all the residents, I mean, I don't wanna say cute and, and diminutive, but uh, just amazing. Like, and we put it with the story online and that is what everybody's commenting on. They're like, those are amazing photos, but that video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, video does is, is, has its own, component you know but i i like print as well so i love the, the texture you know i love holding things as well so uh brian what do you think about this subject yeah i don't think it's a an either or right um yeah, yeah. you know we're storytellers and so we want to reach people where they live whether it's on instagram or facebook or you know in print uh you know podcasting right this is all part of the mix right and so uh, I want to tell a story, and so uh, and I want to reach everybody with it. I certainly like Kate. You know, I'm an ink stained wretch from way back. You know, nothing against that, of course. But you know, it's like I tell. I'm a writer by trade, right? So I tell stories with words. I've worked with photographers and illustrators for years. I've done some work with uh, videographers and animators, and I love that too. Uh, the economics of that are tricky, um, as I'm sure. Laura can speak to. And so, you know, uh, I, I think that for us, it becomes more and more important as storytellers to, to tell more stories digitally. And, and, you know, the digital tools are immense. You know, we, you know, we have just in the past year been using tools for data visualization that, you know, like the page in print is static, but online there are so many, like I was just editing a story online about uh, Tommy Keegan, you know, a local brewer who passed away recently. And I found a video of him getting um, punched in the face as a publicity stunt 10 years ago, right? So I just like, and look, here's Tommy getting punched in the face, right? And very Tommy. Video, <laughs> right in there, you know? And so like, that's, that's an amazing tool to have, which I can't do in print. Right, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Laura, so you are in video. Um, what, do you, what do you think about this? I mean, I think that there's a sense for exactly what both of you know Kate and Brian were saying that that you meet them where they where they live, and some people um, have the attention span and the desire to sit down and read the paper or a magazine, or um, and it's part of their it's part of them, uh, and some people don't have that attention span, <laughs> um, so or they don't have the time yet. Uh, or, you know, they like the, the mix of both. So being able to give people what they need, the information that they need and or want in, in all different ways, I think is really important. And, um, you know, Brian was mentioning that the cost is astronomical in those things, in those ways. Yeah, no Hutsey's really fortunate that two of, actually three of our co-founders are filmmakers. So, um, so we have the sort of luxury of being able to take stories that wouldn't necessarily be able to be told and tell them because our crew can do it with sweat equity. Um, so that's where we're trying to figure out how we can actually uh, build relationships with news outlets like the Chronogram and Hudson Valley Magazine and whoever else is interested uh, to, to sort of collaborate and, and in a way writing articles and and this this journalism is almost a form of pre-production where you've already done the story research and now you just need the visuals to go along with it so it's it's really sort of a natural transition um, and a natural collaboration so i think that it really um it can work for for everybody and and continue to to make those stories more in depth and give everybody uh incredible detail from all from all sides yeah Absolutely. And, you know, at the end, I, I think like I can speak for a lot of people. It really comes down to quality as well. And like for anyone in the audience who, who is not is not really, uh, you know, doesn't know about Hutsey or Hudson Valley Magazine or Chronogram. I mean, the quality of it, all of the work that you guys put out there is really it's really incredible. I, I, I've been I know some of the people from Hutsey. Uh, you know, uh, and I, I've seen the content. Of course, I, I, I went on the, on the website and I looked at the stuff and just the quality of all, you know, and I think like uh, as creators, right, as artists, because we're all artists in this group here, 
uh, we have the responsibility that when we put something out to put the best thing out there, we don't want to add one more to the pile of like <laughs> things that people are making, right? Because it's a large pile. And, you know, I have to say, you guys produce, I mean, amazing work. So, uh, but I do, uh, you know, I, I like the, 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 the use of media as well for the magazines as well. I think that's, that's definitely uh, very useful. I mean, uh, productive. Uh, you know, yeah, if I could just say something like that. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. We've seen a change, though, I think, with video, whereas uh, years ago, I don't know how many, five, ten, say, there was the idea that video had to be this very slick, well-produced affair and now that we all have a video, you know, in our phones, you know, I think that we've all become accustomed to seeing video that's not as produced. And I think that really opens up for those of us who don't have big video budgets. You know, I can say to somebody who's reporting a story, you know, hey, OK, why don't you shoot a little video of like we could do an interview for, you know, talking to somebody Be like, OK, and then now here's our five minute, you know, static video interview. You know, it's not glitzy, we're not doing multi-camera stuff, but you, you get a little taste of it, which is, you know, it gives you, a, it just gives you another little bit of, you know, of the reality. Absolutely. And, you know, to that, it's really like what it comes down to is like the storytelling, right? And you guys are all storytellers. And without a good story, it doesn't really, doesn't really matter how good the video is, or how good the publication is. I mean, without a good story, you don't have anything. I mean, this reminds me of years ago, watching a film called Five Cameras. And uh, it was really shot in like little cameras. It was called five cameras because it was like, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was uh, five cameras got been shot out of the guy's hand. <laughs> you know, because he was like in an area where there was a lot of turmoil. But he was really shooting them like five cameras, like, like just point and shoot, running around. But the storytelling, oh my God, the storytelling was so compelling, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, yeah, we have been accustomed to, to video and not good quality, but as long as the storytelling is good, right? I think that they could surpass that. Uh, so one thing that I, I, I'm also curious, and a lot, a lot of people are curious, and uh, is what makes an event or something like that uh, newsworthy? How do you guys choose which event are you going to cover or, or even what artists, I know a lot of artists would love to be on magazines and things like that, we feature. How do you choose that? And I, you know, I, maybe that's like a, a loaded question, I'm not sure, but uh, anyone can take it. You, you I'm gonna let somebody else go first on this one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Kate, what about you? How do you choose? I don't know, <laughs> exactly, right? Well, uh -huh. you know, it's, it's almost, um... Gosh, sometimes it's based on writing, believe it or not. It's like in the pitch. In the pitch. Yeah, you know, you get a pitch from somebody and it's, or you get a, a, a picture or you're just looking through Instagram and you're like, ah, that's it. It's just something that resonates with me or someone on my staff, but then that you have to think of the reader too. And it's like, well, do people want to read about this person? And what is the hook here? Um, like we're, we're featuring an artist, um, L.F. Tentillo. He's a marine, historical marine artist, um, oh. and renowned for this. And he lives in his studios in Troy and he's got an exhibit at the Albany Institute of Art and History. And I just looked at these paintings. I'm like, this is, looks like a photograph, but I know it's not a photograph because it's the Rondout in the you know 1780s. Like, but it's just something that just, uh, it appealed to me and then I just kind of show it around I'm like what do you guys think so I mean there's so many artists and so many talented people like I often think like why this person over that person but sometimes it's just them reaching out to me <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah absolutely yeah all right that makes a lot of sense though uh Laura how about you how do you guys choose because yours is like a collaboratory right it's almost like uh uh it's it's like open let's say something like that right how do you I mean, guys we, do, like, people what? do people reach out to us and ask us to cover things, um, but also we are constantly paying attention to what's going on. And yes, social media does play a big role in in saying, "Oh, what is this story that's so interesting?" Or what are the other publication? What are the publications covering that's really compelling that makes us want to, you know, elaborate on it? Um, so for us, it's really compelling human stories, a connection to the region that has beautiful visuals to capture um, so we can turn it into a story that's beautiful to watch. Cause for us, it's, it's about the visuals as much as it is about the words. And we also look at social and community impact in the majority of what we do. 
um, as well as entertainment value. So it's balancing, um, you know, something for everybody, basically. And because there's so many great opportunities to be out there covering, and we have a small team at the moment, we, we actually have um, some incredible apprentices and interns, and we're looking at sort of turning them into a Hutsy Street team, so we can send them out to events and send them out to, you know, things that are happening and let them learn in action, you know, from pre-production all the way to editing and then have them be able to put out social content for us that is really interesting. So we're sort of still honing exactly how we take things on, but we're also trying to get to as much as we possibly can. You're almost like scouts, you almost go back, you know, to like the original way to find artists, right? Uh, you know, going to a venue, seeing if they're really jammed, then you bring it like that. Uh, yeah. That's cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a question that a lot of people want to know. Uh, so to that, what, what advice would you have for people? I mean, we just need to like up their like uh, online presence to uh, uh, go to more events. I mean, what would people like uh, that normally, let's say, because not everybody can write a press release. You know what I mean? but you could do an amazing painting. Not everybody's gonna write a lease by making shred on a guitar or something like that. What can we do to those people? What advice would you have for those people? Well, there's a certain uh, you know, level that I look for. You know, if people are saying you should cover my art, well, I wanna, go, I wanna be able to go to your website and see it, right? Because okay. you, know, you should have a website, right? And so uh, here's, here's my work, right? It doesn't have to be fancy, but it has to, you know, it shows that, you know, you're a working artist and that I can get a real sense, you know, of who you are. I don't need the most well-written press release. I can get a simple email from somebody saying, yeah. hey, here's my work. What do you think? And that's, you know, not for nothing. There are, you know, as, as to how we choose what we cover. I mean, we're always going to cover certain things like, you know, we're putting together summer arts preview. So we're going to have you know, Storm King Arts Center. We're going to have Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival, all this Jacob's Pillow, all this stuff that is in you know, these, the big kind of, you know, legacy arts organizations. But I also love to discover new artists, you know, people who don't, you know, I, I don't have a copy of the current cover of the magazine, but we have a, on the, in the May issue, we have a uh, artist who's in her early 20s, who is this amazing painter. And we were so pleased to be able to feature her work on the cover. But you know, uh, in the upcoming months, we're talking about putting some of Keith Haring's work on the cover because he's having a local exhibition, right? So th those two things can exist you know, uh, you know, together. And with regard to artists who want to submit work, it's, you know, I'm, I'm excited to get any kind of a pitch because you know, that just means that's one last thing, you know, Kate, you were talking about going on Instagram, right? Like, you're like looking, looking, searching, searching, searching. That's what we do, right? We're curators, we're curating you know, this experience of our publications. And so, you know, the, if, if you make it easier for me by bringing yourself to me, you know, that just makes my job easier. Yeah. And I have to say, I get more ideas from our um, contact us um, platform than I do from press releases, especially for like essays and, um, and artists. It's it, because, you know, like the Albany Institute of History and Art. That one I guess from a press release and that was a visual, but most of them are coming just are from somebody just says, hey, this is what I'm doing, or I have this idea. And I'll reply to those right away. You know, those come right to me. So it's. Yeah, that's great to know. I think that's encouraging. Uh, I'm sorry, Laura, you were gonna say something? Oh, I was just gonna say that's fascinating. Would have saved me a lot of time writing press releases oh, no. over the years. Oh. <laughs> they're like, they're yeah. like from established venues like that. No, I know, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Yeah, but for, for the up and coming artists, yeah. Absolutely. I don't um, expect that polished press release. You know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think just in general, like if I were to give two bits of advice, it's be nimble, like just be ready to do whatever, whenever, constantly evolve. And also shoot your shot. Like if you have an opportunity, throw the contact us thing in there. Like reach out to Brian, just do like, be out there doing for yourself because you can only be your biggest advocate. Um, so just be that. <laughs> Don't wait for it to come to you. Go to it. Uh, Martin, we, Martin, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I hate to interrupt you, but I have a question in the chat oh, box. Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, it says, it has been my experience that the publication is happy to feature an artist or an organization based on their willingness slash ability to pay for advertising. Comment? Not. 
not with Hudson Valley. I don't, I don't know if, if that's the publication you're talking about. Not at all. It's totally separate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, um, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't specified. It's just a, yeah. a comment in the chat. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I certainly, I, um, and I, again, with Kate, you know, there's a separation between um, edit and sales in our organization. Um, and, I, and I hear sometimes this complaint from people because sometimes, you know, um, our advertisers, we do cover them. That just happens, you know, and then, and also, you know, uh, people are, uh, we don't cover their things, right? So, you know, I say sometimes that, you know, a lot of my job is saying no, right? Because I wish I could cover more stuff, but we have a limited amount of space and we also uh, we're curating. And so we're, you know, we're saying we have this idea about what we want to cover and, you know, 75% of the stuff that I look at, we don't cover. And so, you know, that can create a little bit of resentment sometimes, I think. And I would say sometimes it looks, it's, it's, re, it's the reverse of what it looks like. Like when I first started at Westchester Magazine, I said, okay, so is, is this how it works? Is, is the ads going to come in and then we're going to do the best ofs? And they're like, no, no, no. You know, at first it's the edit, editor's picks and the reader's picks. And then after all that's set, then they reach out to them and say, hey, do you want to advertise? So when you see the ad, you might think that they paid for the edit, but it was the reverse. It was the other way around. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and I also like uh, going with what Laura said, Laura was saying, uh, you are your biggest advocate as an artist. So I think some, a little bit of the responsibility can also fall on the artist as well. Uh, it's just like, you know, uh, you know, I know a lot of people, uh, it's, a, it's an area that people struggle with. Artists, I don't know about all artists, but a lot of artists struggle, struggle with like, uh, uh, the business side of it, or like the, the more like putting yourself out there, making yourself known, uh, where they're very good at creating things and very creative and very amazing at what they do. But that part, that business part, is not that they're incapable, but it's something that uh, maybe we all have to think about it as artists and like maybe foster that part of us a little more. Uh, but I, I know it doesn't come easy for a lot of people, you know what I mean? It's two different sides of the brain. And I've worked with thousands of artists in the last almost two decades. Yeah. And some people use, are able to use both sides of the brain and some people aren't. Like I, I use one side of the brain primarily. <laughs> so, uh, and it's not the artistic side. Um, so I, it's definitely a skill set and it's a struggle for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, being lenient and, and uh helpful is also something I've learned to just be and absolutely the expectation. But I think that's a good advice to people in the arts that what you guys have given. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, of course it, there are things like they may seem because you just said, you guys just said it, right. Oh, it's common sense. Send an email, but you know what I mean? How many people think of that? I don't know. I mean, I, I perhaps wouldn't think about it. Right. Or well, I wouldn't have thought that that could have worked, but uh, it's that idea you get someone at the right time. You know, you open that inbox and it's like, that's just what I need. And then yeah. it happens to be you, right? Yeah. And I know it's, you know, you know, it's hard for anybody to, to feel, you know, to get rejection, but it might not even be rejection. It might be my inbox is so full. Yeah. I haven't seen it. And I think people are afraid sometimes to send a follow-up like, hey, just wanted to alert you. to, But I appreciate that. And I always tell our interns when they leave, I said, just keep pounding away. Cause sometimes I'll be like, okay, I'll write about you. Yeah. Yeah, Kate, that's, well, a great, that's a great point, Kate. Just this idea of persistence and then right. I may have gotten 600 emails that day. And so that one somehow got bulk deleted. And so you sending me a follow-up that does, that's fine. Great. You know, if you know, I'll get back to you and I can say, okay, well, thanks, but no, or thanks right. and yes. Uh, you know what? I had this happen as a quick anecdote, but it kind of goes with this. Uh, when I had my band, right? I had emailed a magazine. Uh, I can't remember which, I think it was, I can't remember which magazine it was, but uh, because I haven't had my band for a while. And uh, a year went by, I'd never heard from them. Or like, I think they sent me a quick email. I never heard from them. You know, a year later, they got back to me and said, hey, Martin, uh, about your band, do you still want to, do you still would like us to come see you? Some would like to write a story. I was like, 
Oh but, my God, the story of my life. I'm a day, a day later, dollar short. I don't know if I have the band. <laughs> <laughs> but they did get back to me, right? So, I mean, I, I can see it. I mean, I can see it even in academia. I mean, inboxes these days are like super full. But I also like the idea that you say, Brian, to like, uh, or, or Kate, say, I think you said it as well, to also be persistent. Don't be afraid to send a follow up email because, I mean, Granted, you guys are very busy people. I'm sure, especially in this field that you are, uh, you constantly must be bombarded with, with, with emails of all kinds, right? So uh, that's also, uh, that's an interesting thing. Be persistent, uh, send those emails, advocate for yourself, be your biggest fan, right? And uh, try to work that, that side of that brain, like you said, Laura, that, that <laughs> artists a lot of times we don't like to use, right? <laughs> or know that you need help and, and get that help from somebody. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Recognize where you need the assistance and then go and make that a part of your business plan. So what about advice for people that would like to uh, enter in, in, the, in the career into like video or like social media or, whatever, or like print or what's up? What advice do you guys have people like that that actually now in the process, like for example, I, I was teaching an internship class this semester uh, and there was a bunch of kids in the new media program uh, that were like looking to enter in the, and I know writers and things like that. What advice do you guys have for those uh, young students or, or people in general? I mean, not everybody has the opportunity to, to go to a college to, to take classes, you know, to have a full education in it. Um, right. But there are a lot of incredible programs locally, at least in, in for film. Um, like there's choice films below the line boot camp and youth fx and the artifact and stockade works and i'm sure i'm missing a hundred of them um, but there are really great opportunities to uh, dig in and find out more and see if it's actually something that you're really interested in and then reach out to the local you know agencies like for us we like i said before are working towards an apprenticeship program and we have interns and we put those interns and those apprentices on set and they learn directly from our co-founders and they, you know, they're doing the recording, they're doing everything. We don't just have them getting coffee. Like we're really giving them hands-on experience. So it's sort of, there's a lot of word of mouth in that, um, finding out what other people have done and also, you know, investing in yourself and going to a program or two and, and, and really making connections that way. Great. What about you, Kate? Any advice of people that want to enter the field? And then we'll go with Brian. Yeah, I mean, it's, gosh, mm. I would say try to like be as multidisciplinary as you can, like get skills in different areas. Like I interviewed a former intern today. It was for a job writing about food and she has gotten some food experience, but she says, oh, I also double majored in uh, in video and uh, social media. I'm like, ah, okay, well, so she can write about food and she can do this. And, you know, cause we're all wearing many hats. Um, and, and I always like, for like the last 10 years any journalism major, I said, just take classes in, uh, you know Google analytics and SEO and just, you know, I mean, that's just common now but um, those are the people we were hiring starting, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Great. Well, if you have any openings in food tasting, uh, I don't know if I can write about it, but I'll, go, I'll definitely go. We're looking for a joining you, Martin. <laughs> yeah. We've got a lot of tasters, yes. Yeah. Thank you. And Brian, what 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 advice would you have for for, for uh, people? Yeah, I mean, hundred percent what uh, Kate said. You know, having you know, when I got into this, you know, I was a writer. I was like, okay, there were there were very clearly defined roles. Like, I was going to write something, and then a photographer would go out and shoot it, right? And so that then you had that was the piece. But now, you know, I spend um, a good portion of time looking at our analytics, right, with our digital editor, because that's how we, you know, see what stories are doing well, right? And usually, it's not surprising. It's like top top 10 you know restaurants in ulster county that does amazing people are really interested in restaurants right our long form interview with an avant-garde poet didn't quite do as well right so be like you, you know that stuff but like being able to understand those tools being able to shoot video being able to 
you know, work with a CMS where, you know, your work where the stories are created digitally, understanding layout tools like InDesign, photography, you know, programs, image programs like Photoshop, like having all of those things at your disposal. I mean, those are, that's where I live all day. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so like, if I want to bring somebody on, I want them to have those tools in their native tool set. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to say, here is what InDesign is. Here is what, here's how graphic design works. Like if you have a good, I don't need necessarily a graphic designer if you're an editor, but you need to be in that program and not screw up the nice design that someone else has created. Right. Or just think visually too. Like I just sent out an editing test and it's the first time I've included design as part of that. And I don't want them to design. I just want to know that they can curate photos. Like show me an example of a, a kitchen that you would put in a layout for a, you know, a reader who makes this amount of money or lives in this kind of a house. So, cause it's hard just to bring in a writer without knowing their sensibility as far as understanding your audience. Yeah. And, and if you look at, if you look at just the three of us that are talking, I don't know enough about you, Martin, to include you here. Um, but just from our stories today, don't be afraid to start at the bottom and work claw your way up. I started in the mailroom at my 17 year career too. And I left as the director of the company. So, um, you know, just. Right. Just, that's, that's great. Like just get a foot in the door somehow, you know. Yeah. And after, show them how good you are. <laughs> yeah. My main um, editorial deputy started out as a part-time graphic designer for us. And then, you know, we just developed a relationship and now, you know, she's my right hand person, yeah. you know, so like get in the door, like, and then you can start to move your way around. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like I got moved to managing editor of the very first magazine I worked at. It was only like a, a two person staff, but um, <laughs> because I knew the history of days of our lives, like nobody else. And I was, yeah. in and I was so excited. I said, I'm going to do this whole layout about who lived in this loft. Cause first it was Patch and Kayla and then it was Bo and Hope. And I did this huge timeline. I love you. <laughs> And they were like, this is amazing. And, and then all of a sudden, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's just great advice. I mean, I'm going to send this video to my students because uh, one advice I always tell people uh, is like continue to learn, right? I mean, that's the thing, continue to learn. I mean, sometimes education, I always say education is as much as like, uh, you know, I tell my students and I maybe I'm wrong, but like uh, to me, yes, you know, getting a degree, is you get a certain amount of information, a certain amount of education on the field, but it's also a testament that you can start and finish something so large as a four year process or two year process. Uh, but just because I always tell them, like if you're gonna apply for a job and they need this and that, well, first of all, you have to be honest, but if you see that over and over, they need this skill. Well, even if you didn't learn at a school, we live, we're blessed the, today that we, we have like lynda.com, right? Or like you have even YouTube, you can always like continue to up your skills. So that if you have the opportunity uh, uh, or, you know, present itself, you're better prepared. Knowing that you always, I think through our lives, we are all constantly learning and creating and learning new skills. At least that should be the goal, I think, to constantly, you know, mold with the times, right? Uh, so uh, I, I love the fact that you guys said that, you know, you have to have a, a knowledge of certain knowledge of this software or things like that and continually uh, continue to grow in your fields and, and learn more and more stuff. Uh, yeah. and I think that's great advice. So thank you so much for that. And I do uh, just want to say, I know you're talking about students specifically that you're working with. So I don't yeah. I don't know if this is maybe not the coolest thing to say. I don't have a college degree. I left college two years in. Uh, because I was honestly learning more at work and I wasn't sure why I was at school. Right. Um, and I then chose to teach myself all of those things. Like you're saying, I figured out what skills I needed for the role that I was in and I learned them. And then I learned the next set. So there is an enormous amount of positive things that come out of finishing college. I know I, most of my friends have double degrees and are, you know, surgeons and doctors and things, but, <laughs> um, but it wasn't for me. And yeah. I've still managed to be the head of multiple companies and have a very sex su successful career. So I'm just absolutely. putting that out there as well. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And like I said, this, I happen to teach now, but when I opened my first company, I'm not going to go into that. It was very successful. I had a GED. I didn't even finish high school. 
<laughs> right? So I opened a company. I was 26. By the time I was 27, I lived in a 5,000 square foot home. And I mean, I had like cars, like, all stuff. I didn't even go to school, right? Yeah. Uh, I went to school as an adult, you know what I mean? So because it was something that my family very much valued, and I valued, and I made change a career. So not everybody has to go to school, yeah. but everybody has to have that grit. Everyone has to have that drive that, that it, I'm going to invest in myself no matter yeah. what, you know yeah. what I mean? And that is something that perhaps we need to teach more in, in, a, in college or in schools altogether. Figure you out what you love yourself, and right? make it work. Yeah. Right, if you don't bet on yourself, how can you expect people to bet on you, right? Right, so, I mean, I totally, I totally get that. And I, I thank you so much for all your anecdotes, all your, all your, your, your advice and your, your amazing things that you guys have shared with us. Uh, it is 5.55 normal, we end at 6.00. And uh, 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 normally we have a lot of questions, but today uh, we have don't have a whole lot of questions, but we had such a like enjoyable conversation with you guys. I mean, I love you guys. Uh, I mean, where does time go, right? <laughs> it's yeah, it's gone. Stuff, but it's like, it's gone. So if anyone, uh, the audience doesn't have any other questions, uh, thank you, someone says they really enjoyed it. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna let you guys go. This will go online. So if you guys would like to share, uh, for those of you guys who have been here, would like to share that. I'm sure uh, Sarah is going to make it available as a video on YouTube. So that'll be great. But I would like to thank you so much, uh, Laura. Thank you so much, Kate. And thank you so much, Brian. And again, thank you for so much for everyone that came uh, and it was part of this. And Gretchen, thank you for doing the back end. And Sarah, for, and Sarah also, although she's not here, uh, without you guys, this wouldn't happen. And the Arts Council, of course, and everybody that supports it. So with that said, uh, I hope someday our path will cross and we can meet in person. Uh, but until then, take care of yourselves uh, and be safe. And uh, best of luck with everything you do. And thank you so much for all you guys do. Uh, we certainly appreciate it in the Orange County here in the uh, Hudson Valley. Excuse me. <laughs> thank you, Martin. You were fantastic. Thank you, so much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care. Have a good evening. Bye.